second of the Dunning Africa Center webinar uh, series. I'm delighted to be here yet again. And, uh, and you know, really, really, we've got a, a very interesting program today. And I'm, of course, I'm here with my, my co-host, uh, uh, Jonathan Foster Pedley, uh, who is, uh, as usual, with bells on, ready to jump into this very interesting debate. Um, and it's a skeptic's guide uh, to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, a subject of great interest to so many people right now. And uh, yeah, and we'll have the good fortune of having two uh, of the most brilliant minds on the subject uh, with us today. We've got uh, um, we've got people with amazing CVs, people who know a lot about uh, free trade areas integration screen schemes and have been working on this issue for uh, a couple of decades some of uh, and longer in some cases um, and I'm really really I think we're, we're lucky to have managed to persuade them to come and join us. Um, Jonathan do you want to uh, uh, yes well I, I'd like to welcome welcome you uh, Rajneesh it's a pleasure to see you again. Welcome our guests, and I'm looking forward to this. I do love a skeptic's guide, don't you? I mean, yes. you know, we're you know, it's not the cynic's guide, it's the skeptic's guide. So let's have a dive in and see what we can find here. Because we're all so positive about this, uh, you know, this uh, ACFA. So uh, let's see what really works and what doesn't. Yes. So quickly to introduce our two speakers so we can get straight into, uh, into the action, as it were. So first we have Dr. Francis Mangeni, uh, a man of many, many parts. Uh, he's a, a senior fellow at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance and also a senior advisor to the, the African Free Trade Area uh, Agreement Secretary General. He has uh, worked and consulted with almost every known organization and some that I didn't even know about. Uh, over the, the over his career, and he had been writing about this, this since his PhD. From what I understand, that his doctorate was on this very subject. So, you know, really, we are coming to the the uh, one of the greatest experts on on the subject. He's worked with Callistus Juma, which is something that uh, it always impresses me. Uh, I met Callistus a couple of times, and every time I, I met him, I learned something new and. Uh, I'm presuming that anyone who's worked with him also has the capacity to surprise you with new information on a regular basis. We have uh, Dr. Andrew Mould, uh, uh, who is an old friend of mine, and uh, uh, currently uh, he is he's based in Kigali, uh, and he's the chief of the uh, UN Commission uh, Economic Commission for Africa on Regional Integration. And the, and, the, and on the cluster on the agreement itself. At the, and he sits in Kigali, as I said. I've known him for a number of years. He's worked at the United Nations in Santiago in Chile. He's worked at the United Nations in uh, Addis. Uh, he worked for the OECD in the middle. Um, and in fact, his PhD thesis, many people will not remember this, and he might not remember this, had a lot to do with uh, European integration, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Andrew, have, perhaps you've also forgotten by now. No, no, you're quite right. Yes, it was on FDI and uh, continental integration, yes. He's uh, also uh, a, a renowned author and he's been, uh, in fact, he's editing a special issue of Journal of African Trade on this particular issue as well. So we have here, you know, people without any doubt who know what they're doing and they have a almost complete book on this subject, which we're all hoping to buy as soon as we, we can uh, by Hearst Publishers. So uh, let me kick off and uh, come to you, Francis. So you know, what inspired you? Uh, why are you writing this book? Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Raj. And I'd like to uh, recognize uh, George. Now, we, as you said, this uh, subject of the African continental free trade area is of great interest. And uh, you mentioned Kalistos Juma, who believed that when it comes to trade, Africa should be one country. That's what he used to say. Now, according to the media, since the AFCFTA uh, was signed on the 21st of March in 2018, 
Uh, the AFC FTA has been hailed as a game changer, as a milestone. There is a lot of interest in the subject, both in the media, among stakeholders, including government, private sector, and academia. But at the same time, there are skeptics, like yourself, Raj, you know, <laughs> who believe that uh, the AFC FTA is going to suffer the same fate like uh, other integration experiments on the continent that have been signed with a lot of fanfare, but implementation has been lacking. Now, uh, we believe that this is not going to be uh, the case when it comes to the African continental free trade area. So Anda and I are putting together a book to demonstrate that uh, political ownership is very high. This is a critical success factor for integration uh, uh, programs on the continent. That is a solid economic case for the African continental free trade area. And that legally and institutionally, it is a sound project. So this is what we are going to demonstrate. And therefore, that the prospects are very good for this African continental free trade area. And we're also going to show that it's not a, we are not beginning from a clean slate. It's not tabla rasa. We are building on existing regional economic communities, a number of which have been quite successful. You only have to look at the East African community, for instance, or COMESA, for instance, the institutions that have emerged out of COMESA, whether it's the Trade and Development Bank, which started over as a Comesa uh, a project, but it's now a continental bank. Or you need to look at SADC. It is a industrialization programs. It is infrastructure programs, which have now been replicated at the continental level. Or ECOWAS, though its trade agenda has not been very successful, but at least its peace and security operations are something to talk about, which have actually inspired the African peace and security architecture. So we are going to show that there is actually somewhere we are beginning uh, from uh, and on which to build and therefore that the prospects are good. Now, maybe Andy would like to add <laughs> on what I've just said. Yes, and I thank you, Francis. Yes, I mean, I, I just stress these things come from a bit, bit of a, you know, uh, is the glass half full or half empty? And we clearly come from the half full school of thought on this. Um, the reason for writing the book um, was that we just felt there were a lot of misconceptions about the African continental free trade, you know, Africa integration and how well it's proceeded in the past and what the prospects are for the future. And there's another way of looking at it as well. Not only do we try to make the positive case for the AFCFTA, but we also try to discount the alternative strategies which have been put forward in, in the past and which haven't really attained any success. So for example, in terms of uh, Africa's success in, in diversifying its economies, or, or managing to export to high income countries. In the past, they really haven't succeeded in doing this. Um, so for example, preferential market accesses to the European Union or to the US, whether it's under a GOA or under the Lomé or Cotonou agreements, everything but arms, you find that African countries have made some minor successes in niches, but it hasn't been transformational in any sense. And uh, there is a sense in which we feel, you know, it's a little bit like, um, I think the, the quote is attributed to Einstein sometimes, isn't it? You know, madness, what's the definition of madness? You know, repeating the same thing and expecting different results. That's why we strongly believe that the, the continental agenda has to move forward this time, uh, because the other alternatives to continental development really haven't worked in the way that was hoped of. That's, I mean, one of the, for me, one of the, you know, I, these points are well made. I think that uh, SADC has, in fact, uh, proven to be fairly successful in promoting uh, industrialization and kind of a, you know, kind of a flying geese model where uh, activities have, have spread along the supply chains to countries further down uh, from South Africa, with South Africa driving the agenda to a great extent. And acting as kind of uh, a kind of uh, shepherding this whole thing through. So, to what extent is it necessary for us to for for this uh, this time around to think about this at a 
uh, uh, at a continental level. I mean, you know, we can see, for instance, in Europe, Germany's participation in integration was key to you know, bringing it to fruition. And you know, their insistence, uh, their uh, dogged insistence really over a long period to make sure that this happened. So to what extent is that, is, uh, is that a, a conditio sin qua non for a, for a FTA, uh, Francis? Yeah, right. So the big economies around the continent, um, which of course includes South Africa, as you just mentioned, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, uh, Ethiopia, are solidly behind the AFCFTA, according to pronouncements from these countries uh, at the highest political level, by their heads of state, by their ministers of foreign affairs, by their ministers of trade. So I think the signals are positive uh, from these countries. Uh, these countries also happen to, I'm sure Andrew will mention this later, happen to enjoy you know, huge trade surpluses with their neighbors. And therefore, the political economy of managing opening up uh, should be um, manageable. They should be able to actually increase their imports from their neighbors uh, without too much difficulty. Yes, so you are right that the big countries need to be front runners. They need to own this process. They need to be natural leaders, as you said, just as has, has happened in Europe uh, with, with Germany and France. Yeah, and uh, we believe that they are actually poised uh, to play uh, this role, according to what yeah. we're Francis, saying. What uh, Francis, uh, yes, if I yeah. may come in. So if you look at yes, the um, trade surplus that uh, South Africa has with the rest of the continent, um, South Africa exports approximately 20, this was the figures from about 2019, 20, just before the pandemic actually, is about 24 billion US dollars to the continent and imports about 10 billion. So it does have quite a large trade surplus with the rest of the continent. And effectively, as Francis said, it is a, one of the issues is for the larger economies to become more open to imports from the rest of the continent uh, for the agreement to succeed. And Rajneesh, yes, you're quite right in the sense that, um, you know, the continent does need certain champions and the larger economies are well placed to do that in a, in a sense. Um, Kenya, for example, in our region has a very pivotal role in terms of foreign direct investment in the region. And that already has quite a lot of investment in sectors such as banking, tourism and the like. So um, yes, I think that's definitely the case. We need the larger countries on board. Perhaps the one case we could speak to and which you know most about Rajneesh would be the case of Nigeria because initially, um, Nigeria was a little bit more ambiguous towards the agreement and it took them some, some more time to, uh, to sign up and ratify the agreement. Um, and I think that was over concerns of the business community there about imports from neighboring countries and transshipment very crucially. They were worried about imports coming from the rest of the world that would be benefiting unfairly from the agreement. So that's all tied up with the rules of origin, origin regulation. Um, but still, yeah, I still think it's the smaller countries which are going to gain the most, strangely enough, from this agreement, because the landlocked countries, for example, are the ones which already have very high levels of intra-African trade, but who actually could benefit, I think, from greater levels of investment. Uh, removing the small country constraint from them would be a very important step forward for those countries. Yeah, and if, if I can just add, uh, before you come in again, uh, Rajneesh, Yes, so every effort has been made to accommodate concerns uh, emanating from these uh, uh, big countries. If you take Nigeria, for instance, that Andy has just mentioned, uh, following complaints about what was happening in the uh, Burkina Faso, the, the, the transshipment, um, the Secretariat moved in quite speedily to actually propose the establishment of a dedicated division at the Secretariat dealing with customs matters with matters of transshipment, rules of origin, in order to uh, convince Nigeria or to demonstrate to Nigeria that actually the AFCFT as a whole is going to take this matter of transshipment quite seriously by rigorously enforcing rules of origin to make sure that only originating products, products that are made in Africa, that originate on the continent, benefit from references. Our concerns in South Africa, as well as in Ethiopia, which is also a big country, about you know, uh, managing the amount of imports that come into uh, the country 
uh, were also addressed through the flexibility that was introduced in opening up only up to 90% of uh, the products over a period of five years, 10 years for LDCs, and then the rest being sensitive or even excluded 3%. So there has been every effort to, you know, to, to deployed to uh, make sure that uh, these concerns are dealt with so that these countries have a level of comfort in uh, uh, joining the FCFTA and implementing it. To what question. extent, to, yes, it's me, my turn this time to screw up with okay. the, the mute key. <laughs> uh, to what extent uh, can laggard slow us down? I think the, if I, I remember reading somewhere about the convoy test. Uh, uh, can you perhaps you can explain a little bit about this? You know, the, I, know I know the mechanism prevent a hold up by one or two or three disinterested members. How are we going to prevent that? Because this is very key that, you know, lots of countries move forward and like the WTO, which is always held up by, you know, because it's on a consensus basis, one person, one country holds up the whole uh, procedure uh, or a group of countries strategically do so. How are we going to avoid that type of situation uh, in, this, uh, in this case? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. Um, I think the fact that uh, we now have kind of a critical mass of ratifications. Um, is it 44 currently, Francis? I believe that's the figure. Yes, it is, yes. yes. Yeah, so, For, I mean- 42, yes. Yeah, the, the, the degree of consensus across a continent as large as Africa is really quite amazing. You know, if you think of all the disputes that happened in the European Union during its uh, teething years, you know, the early years and how long it took to actually expand to a block of 28 and now it's compressed a little bit to 27, regrettably. Um, and, and Africa's dealing with, you know, 55 AU member states, you know, and only one country failed to sign the agreement. Um, so that in itself represents a remarkable degree of consensus. Now we have uh, 42, Francis is saying, is actually officially deposited their instruments of ratification now of the agreement. And those countries are now obliged to start liberalizing their tariffs. Now, one area of concern has been the fact that the rules of origin negotiations have prolonged so, so, so long. And um, those rules of origin negotiations uh, were concluded for 88% of goods, but there was stumbling blocks over rules of origin for textiles and clothing, which is quite a contentious part of it, and also automobiles. Um, now, my understanding is that they've come to finally an agreement that uh, trading, the, tra the tariff reductions will go ahead um, in July, um, that they're going to just exclude the ones, the tariff lines where they haven't been able to reach agreement on the rules of origin, but start liberalizing for all the rest. So I think that will be an important step forward. And if you look at the countries which are ratified, you don't see pictures of countries, you know, like isolated there, which are going to be, you know, there's just a, there will be enough critical mass for some very meaningful trade to happen amongst them, basically, is what I'm saying. The important thing is the tariff reductions are implemented and implemented quickly. And my understanding is because the tariff reductions weren't implemented last year, I think they're going to do catch up. So they're actually going to do double the amount of tariff liberalization for the end of this year. Um, it will take time. All these processes of integration take time. Um, between signing the single market program and implement it, it took seven years for the European Union. Yeah. The African continent took just three years to manage this for the African continent. But the tariff liberalization process, as Francis was saying, you know, that we got five years for non-LDCs, 10 for LDCs, plus an extra few years for the 90% for the, uh, target, 97% target to be reached. So it is a gradual thing. And I, I do keep saying to people, don't expect this to change things overnight. It won't, it, you might not even be seeing visible results from this next year or the following year. It's gonna take the course of this decade. But I suspect by the time we get into the 2030s, you'll see a very different panorama in terms of trading opportunities and investment opportunities for African firms and businesses. Right, yeah, so if I can just add a little bit. Yes, indeed, in fact, uh, what's envisaged is that say uh, by 2030, we should begin to see uh, something happening on the ground in terms of impact, because then the tariff liberalization 
would have run its course. But I just wanted to address this question of the convoy effect, as it is sometimes uh, called, you know, called, you know, um, th there is this principle of variable geometry. Uh, it has been used elsewhere, even in the European Union, where those who are ready can move, can, can go on. Though, of course, in principle, nobody should be left behind, no country should be left behind, and nobody should be left behind. But uh, out, out of pragmatism, uh, if there are countries that have particular constraints and they cannot move at a given time, well, they can hold on. But then that should not prevent those who are ready uh, to move forward. So this principle has been applied in the regional economic communities across Africa, and it has been applied quite uh, uh, effectively. And it should help also with the African uh, continental uh, free trade area. But then should it come to the worst? Because you say that we proceed by consensus. Should it come to the worst? There is a track record at the African Union uh, level for actually voting on critical decisions. Actually voting at the African Union level is quite routine. We have got there an electronic system for voting. So it's no problem at all. It just happens, it takes just a few minutes and, and then uh, the decisions are taken uh, through uh, a vote. But we, we don't have to come to that level, but that option is available. So this again means that uh, we shouldn't expect you know, to <laughs> have blockages as such. We, there, there are pathways forward. Uh, on difficult issues. So yeah, I, you know, as you, as you both mentioned, uh, the EU has had you know, Britain was uh, permanently on a different speed from everybody else uh, until recently when they decided to completely leave the convoy. Um, so this is actually kind of a, there is a lesson there. I think that, that one you know one should not be held hostage by. Uh, by by an outlier uh, when when the majority and that's one of the issues which uh, I think is of of concern uh, moving forward the multiple speeds how does one manage the multiple speeds and it seems to me there's a very large role for diplomacy uh, and again the the role of the of the bigger countries to persuade the smaller countries uh, uh, to uh, to see they you know the, the the greater good rather than the, the next election, if you see what I mean, uh, and which is often the case. Uh, local politics tends to trump everything else, uh, as we have seen again uh, in where, you know, we take also the former North American free trade area, which was uh, held hostage by, by, by Trump uh, until he, weak, he tried his best to weaken it to the point that it lost its purpose. Uh, you know, but anyway, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to come in there and say, I think there's a fundamental difference in the sense that, um, you know, there's a, a deep sentiment of Pan-Africanism across the continent. Now, it's not always reflected at the political level, but certainly when people are asked about these matters by Gallup or by Afrobarometer, for example, you'll see that people generally feel, you know, that Pan-Africanism has been the way to go. Um, there's a lovely article by the... Uh, economist Tandika Makandawiri, the Malawian economist who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, where he talks about this, you know, he says, you know, it's, it's been a failure sometimes of our political leadership, but not in terms of sentiment. And I think that marks a difference, perhaps there's a there's already a strong African identity there, whether that's reflected in African t shirts or, you know, general love for common music and, and, and culture. Um, but that does give a basic building block, I think, for the continental agreement. Yeah, and if I, if I could also just say, mention, yeah, you know, politics should actually make sense. It should make good sense. Yeah, th th this is what we really believe. Um, there should be, you know, uh, a good economic case that can be taken up by politicians, you know, and uh, this case can be presented by the political leaders to stakeholders, uh, to, to the people. Now, the argument, actually, as we are going to demonstrate in the is that uh, the African continent of free trade area is going to help address public policy objectives that uh, politicians or political leaders talk about every day. Job creation, putting food on the table, addressing inequality, gender empowerment, supporting SMEs, of course, through regional value chains, through linking them into the big companies around the continent. 
So um, this, this argument that, you know, the, you know, the Trumpian way, that, you know, local politics, you know, we should be uh, America first or this country first. At the end of the day, actually, it doesn't make sense. As in fact, we are already beginning to see in the US, uh, we are stronger together. And in the world of our times, I don't think there's a room for isolationism anymore. I think we, we, we though, though we're talking about deglobalization across, across the world now, because of you know the geopolitics, what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, and things like that. Still, I think maybe these are just blips. I think in the long run, we shall realize that we are stronger together. There are global challenges that we can only address uh, together. And uh, the larger the market, in the case of Africa, the better, because it's only a large market that can support critical levels or sustainable levels of investment on the continent for job creation and for dealing with all these public policy concerns that political yeah. leaders are talking about. I may day. just come in there, um, <laughs> put a question really to you, Rajneesh, um, coming from India. You know, I think there's a sentiment now as well about the balkanized nature of a lot of small smaller African countries uh, makes it very difficult for effective policy making. You know, so economies of scale, I know there's a debate about the degree to which economies of scale are so important for industrialization with the fourth industrial revolution and the like, but they're still very important in some key industries. And also from a political point of view, a lot of the smaller African countries have tremendous difficulty in negotiating, for example, United States was proposing that post Goa they have individual bilateral trade in relations with the US. Now, tiny countries negotiating with economic giants clearly is not a very viable policy in this global world that we live in. And of course, the rise of India and China, I think, has concentrated minds even more on that on the African continent. And the fact that China has had such an enormous presence in the continent over the last two decades as well. So there's, I think there's a strong rationale for working together in a way that maybe wasn't true maybe two, three, four decades ago. I think I, I should clarify that as an economist, I am not a skeptic about uh, in, uh, economic integration. I'm 100% behind the concept. I really believe in scale economy. I really believe in no borders. Um, all of these things, I believe in them. I not just believe them, I know that they are good for for welfare, they're good for inequality, they're good for uh, industrialization. So like I, I'm on the, we're on the same page when it comes to these in general. My skepticism only arises in the fact that that uh, in the people have been talking about Pan-Africanism, but they talk the talk, but not don't walk the walk. You know, we go back to to um, uh, Nkrumah in the you know 1957. He's a lot of his of his uh, you know of his discussion and what the inspiration that, that uh, many years after, you know, the idea of having Pan-Africanism really came from that point in time. But, you know, and, and I was an undergraduate in Nigeria. This was the conversation at the university. Let's, you know, Africa, Africa. Now my classmates who are politicians, I won't mention any names here. Uh, some of them are now, I don't remember what Kwame Nkrumah said, or care what they said. It's just a slogan that they were used to saying when they were students. Yeah. That's my, my, my <laughs> That was a very different world, wasn't it? I mean, for starters, there was the Cold War period where African countries were divided in terms of the influ external influences playing on them. Um, that's one big difference. And of course, we also had the terrible situation of the 80s and 90s, which were really the lost developmental de decades for the continent. Yeah. And that's partly because of, again, externally imposed policies, a set of policies at the time. Mm -hmm. Since the 2000s, I think the continents turned a corner. Uh, that was partly on the back of higher commodity prices. But I think there were things that were really changing on the ground as well in terms of, you know, the growth prospects for many countries across the continent. Now, we're certainly in a difficult period of transition now post pandemic and a lot of uncertainties in the global economy. But I think Francis and I would still both argue the situation is much more propitious for the continental integration now than it was 60 or 70 years ago. Yeah, and if I may just add to what Andy had just said, right. Yeah. Kwame Nkrumah was not the only Pan-Africanist no. on the continent in the late 50s or 60s. There were, there were strands of Pan-Africanism 
Julius Nyerere was equally a Pan-Africanist. So there were only differences on whether to have the Big Bang approach that Kwame Nkrumah was uh, proposing, namely establish a union government with a common defense, you know, one government, one head of state in 1963, mm -hmm. or whether you phase it out and do it progressively as Nyerere and his group were arguing. So there, there, there was simply a difference of tactics really. But the, the idea that Africa should work together, I don't think that was disputed at all by, uh, by, by you know, Kwame Nkrumah and by those who were considered to be uh, his uh, opponents. I thought that this is something that needs to be clarified, you know? <laughs> and, uh, that, you, know you, you cannot just say Pan-Africanism, that is what in Kwame Nkrumah said. No, 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 no. Actually, Asante, I'm, I'm, I'm this being point. especially uh, um, <laughs> provocative. Yeah. Uh, I also know what Nirere said. So, uh, but yeah, just to, to start the discussion, uh, uh, Jonathan, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I mean, this is really fascinating learning, dis learning discussion. Um, but I, I mean, Andrew, I, I wonder if you could answer. I mean, some people say that this is an absolute fantasy because of the very limited amount of intra-African trade in the measurements. I mean, I know that's written in some books. I mean, so is this really just a dream? Or, or are these stats right? What do you think? Oh, well, Jonathan, I don't know if you've been doing your background research on things I've recently published or or you're doing <laughs> asking that question to provoke me. I'm just, I'm just a savant. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, listen, um, I strongly take exception to this idea about intra-African trade being insignificant and very, very low compared with other continents. And and, and it, it hurts me every time I hear a presentation where people start off with, oh, only 16% of African trade is intracontinental trade. It's a figure which is so misleading for, for a number of reasons. I mean, one is firstly the commodity exporting nature of some key economies on the continent. And that very much changes the picture. So for example, the Nigerian petroleum exports or the Angolan petroleum exports or the DRC mineral exports, those figures actually, quite obviously those, those exports tend to go outside the continent and they drag down the total of intracontinental trade. But it's a bit of an optical illusion because if you compare it, for example, with Latin America in Mercosur, um, in the East Africa community, intra-regional trade is at 20%. Inter East Africa community is relatively resource poor. Mercosur is only 12%, and it's because they have Brazil and Argentina in there, which are important commodity exporters. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is actually the largest economies on the continent aren't so integrated as the average. Uh, that's particularly ca the case of Nigeria because of its oil exports, but also Egypt to some extent, because Egypt being a North African nation has more stronger links with Europe. South Africa, because of its history of apartheid, is actually a very important intra-African trader. It's the largest one in absolute terms, but would be much more so if it hadn't had that history of apartheid. Mm. So for that reason, the three larger economies actually drag down the continental intra-regional total. And a third reason is that Africa is famous for its level of intra, um, informal, sorry, informal intra-continental trade. Um, to the extent that there's a lot of cross-border trade which isn't registered properly in, in uh, formal trade statistics. Now, that is a global phenomenon. It happens elsewhere. So, for example, in parts of Asia like Laos and Cambodia or Bolivia and Paraguay, it happens. But I think there's a consensus among ex experts that it's a lot more prominent on the African continent. So I say these three points just to stress that actually, if you recompute the real level of intra-African trade, you'll find it's a lot more important to your average African country than the headline statistics suggest. And I've done some calculations for the landlocked countries of the continent, for example, and it it's probably around 42, 44% of total trade. Country like Uganda, so over 50% of their trade is with the continent. Rwanda, post-pandemic also more than, 50% of its trade has been with the continent. So I think our point of departure to just lament the low level of intra-African trade is wrong. 
it is actually of a lot greater economic significance. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't be a lot higher. I do believe with this continental liberalization and process of harmonization and removal of non-tariff barriers and trade facilitation, then it could go much higher. But I just think a lot of those typical comparisons are just misleading and not, not accurate, actually. Thanks. So, so that really resonates with people's lived experiences when they travel in Africa. They see a lot of vibrancy, but trucks going over the borders and you take out these big, these big lumps of sort of um, basic factors and basic exports, you'll see that the percentage goes shooting up. Um, that's very, so that's a little bit of a vaccine for Rajneesh's um, skepticism, I think, right? Well, you know, some, some numbers some really which, matter. Right? It will take more than that, I'm afraid. Some yeah. of which is manufactured <laughs> because I am actually working on uh, informal economic activity, informal trade. And one of our speakers, uh, we're not yet scheduled for uh, December, perhaps, is, a, is a, a group of people studying informal trade between uh, Uganda and Kenya. And uh, the amount of trade that takes place, despite the fact that there have been simplification of regulations and so forth, people still prefer to follow the traditional way of uh, exporting, uh, which is bypassing the official uh, procedures. And that is, in fact, the case between Nigeria and Niger. I, I, I grew up uh, closer to that border, and I used to watch as a child the, the caravans, the, the camels still coming in. I, maybe they don't do it anymore. It's, uh, times have changed. But you would see, you know, I, I will remember the first time I, I saw it at the age of seven, seeing a hundred camels, maybe more, coming in very slowly from the desert. Um, and then, uh, you know, this trade taking place just before the rain started, at the beginning of the rainy season. So this was something that really, I'm sure it's much larger. So I agree with you. It's not, there's no question about it. I am playing devil's advocate, by the way, to some extent. Uh, but... This uh, camel story uh, brings me to kind of another kind of uh, concern of mine is the absence of, of transport infrastructure. So yes, we have the, the case for East African integration and increased trade. We have a case for West African integration and so on, as, uh, and SADC and so forth, which already exists. But the problem is that between North and West or West and East, West and East is my favorite example. I um, driving from uh, Nigeria to 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 Uganda is uh, is not a straight, straightforward process uh, at any time of the year. Um, and uh, anyone who's ever tried to do so, or even tried to plan to do so, uh, is generally left in shock. Uh, to what extent will these things slow down uh, the? Uh, or does it make any sense then to have? maybe to focus instead on improving regional, initially improving regional uh, cohesiveness than worrying about continental cohesiveness. And again, I'm being a uh, devil's advocate. Francis. Yes. So now uh, let me just start by, first of all, um, assuring John that uh, uh, a lot of analysis has been done about uh, you know, the potential growth uh, of intra-Africa trade by the World Bank, by the IMF, by the Economic Commission for Africa. And the analysis seems to be uh, unanimous uh, that the prospects are really good. So I, I hope that uh, we can do, we can read those uh, uh, works as well, in addition to what the skeptics are putting out, right? <laughs> now, uh, turning to you, Raj, or Nish, um, Africa is, a, is huge, 30 million uh, square kilometers. So it's famously said that you can actually get the US, the EU, India, China, and fit all of them into Africa. So it's huge, it's huge. And therefore these infrastructure problems uh, can only be natural, how to interconnect you know, such a large place. Not talking also, of course, about the uh, exact geography, the precise geography, where they are talking about deserts, you know, impassable rivers, or rainforests and things like that. Yes, so you are spot on that uh, we need to prioritize uh, initiatives to interconnect Africa, you know, to have this uh, economic infrastructure uh, that uh, can interconnect Africa. So that's right. And uh, fortunately, the ECA actually has uh, done some analysis uh, recently and come up with a bill of 
$411 billion that will be required uh, by the year 2030 to address some of these challenges. Uh, we shall need 2.2 million uh, trucks. We shall need 135,000 railway wagons, 243 aircraft, things like that, uh, in order for uh, intra-Africa trade to really boom uh, to its full capacity uh, in order to address these same uh, infrastructure uh, problems. It's also famously said, uh, of course, from analysis by the ADB and other institutions, uh, that uh, the financing gap for infrastructure in Africa, whether you're talking about surface transport, air transport, energy or ICT is quite high. The gap is quite high. So we need to mobilize our resources. But having said that, it doesn't mean that we do nothing now, right? As we speak now, Chinese imports into Africa are growing actually exponentially. You only need to look at the trends over the last two decades. They are using the same roads that we have, the same railways that we have. Yes, so it's feasible for trade to continue. Of course, though, it can increase much faster if we address this uh, infrastructure uh, uh, constraints. I think the message here is that the problem has been identified and something is being done about it. And this is not a political rumor. <laughs> you, you can actually check it out. Uh, if, if I might come in here. Well. Yes, yes, I mean, Andy, please come in. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, um, Rajneesh, I mean, what you're implying is, you know, is there a need to build up the infrastructure and connectivity before the integration? And I think this, the answer is probably no. You, you need, you know, the right policy signs in the right direction first. You know, you don't wait till the circumstances are perfect for a process of integration to go forward. Um, there's a question actually, which uh, I just yes. wondered if we could turn to. But, yes, uh, I was from, going to turn to it from, from Andrew. Uh, from, uh, Andrew, Andrew, yes. Yes, he's, got a, well, he's got quite a list of questions, but the first one I, I think know. is particularly I was going to, I was going to them, them. And let yeah. me suggest this. The last three questions, the three are really focused on the issue of industrialization and value chains. And of course, you know, it's my bias, subject bias towards mm. uh, development and uh, FDI and uh, global value chains. So let's let's turn to let's start with question two, um, um, and I think this is a, a, the what is the status of regional value chains in Africa, and to what extent could regional value chains be of importance or play a significant role in the success of the ACFTA? Um, Andrew, do you want to start this one? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I know the studies of you know, regional and global value chains tend to give rather disappointing results for the continent, stressing how weak the development of regional value chains are, um, which is probably true. You know, it's, it's definitely the case that, um, you know, there hasn't been enough um, intra-regional investment really to make some of those um, value chains come into being which actually takes me to the first point he's he's asking about as well. He says, shouldn't we be concerned not just about rules of origin for goods, but for capital? And of course, the investment protocol is a fundamental part of the agreement too. And cross-border investment is one of the principal drivers, as we know globally, of cross-border trade as well. So I think there's a shift in the discussion about global value chains now. You, you're the expert on this particular theme, Rajneesh, but We've seen the growth of global value chains slow down since around 2014, 2015, if the World Bank figures are to be believed. And that was even prior pandemic. And now we see a lot of talk about regionalization. Now, I know there's a degree of skepticism about that as well. But for example, I recently saw the European Union's proposals now for a carbon tax, which is basically going to punish countries which are more intensive in the use of carbon in their industrial processes. And that will basically give the advantages back to countries closer to the European Union or within the European Union. And again, it will be another impediment to the integration of African countries into those kind of value chains. So I think there's a change in trend and shift there. And what we need is more cross-border investment within the continent to make those regional value chains really viable. Right, and if I can just add, 
Right, so the AFCFTA Secretariat has uh, developed a private sector strategy, which identifies some key regional value chains. And then uh, uh, not too long ago, actually November last year, uh, the AFCFTA and UNDP put out a joint uh, publication entitled, Which Regional Value Chains for a Made in Africa Revolution? Where they identify 10 uh, regional regional value chains. I actually happen to be an editor together with the two others of that uh, publication. Yes, so I think the answer to Andrew Othiano is that uh, the reg regional value chains are very important. It is through regional value chains that we shall actually get the industrialization and uh, transformation that we talk a lot about uh, on the continent. So I think, uh, I think Andrew Othiano is spot on in identifying them as a, an important area for intervention. Yeah. I, I, I hesitate to, to, to kind of, I'm supposed to be asking the questions rather than suggesting some answers, but I, I feel kind of obliged to say something here. Um, so Andrew, you the point about the import substitution industrialization. Um, I haven't, I don't, I think we should, it's time to let this one go. Import substitution industrialization, uh, had its day in the sun, and the way in which the, the 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 world is functioning today, for a variety of reasons, one can do this within the WTO framework for a maximum period of seven years if you're an LDC under the subsidies and countervailing measures agreement. So the only way really to do this, this there are ways to get around the SCM issues. Uh, and do infant industry protection. But nowadays, the only way to do this is to do it on the go. It, to Infant industry protection has to happen and the, on the go, which is actually a completely, um, a very a big topic on its own. Uh, so yes, it doesn't work. We cannot necessarily uh, go back to the good old days, or if we want to call it that, where import substitution was allowed and we were able to have import barriers uh, in the same way. Uh, today's world does not allow this. And I think maybe we'll be going off topic if I develop this theme uh, a bit further. But I now come to the point of regional value chains. One of the key regional value chain are associated with agriculture. And agriculture is one of the most important uh, sources of income for a large portion of, of the African continent. Uh, uh, informal economy and th what's happening is all of these things are being exported. Um, how does one increase the value, the share of the value accruing to the farmers who are growing these crops which are then being exported? They are part of the value chain but they are unfortunately at the lowest part of the value chain where they have no bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the large firms. Now that is something that, that governments can do, which is increasing the share of the value being accrued to the farmers. In fact, this is exactly what I'm working on uh, in my role as a policy advisor in Nigeria. How do we increase the share? And it is possible. And this is not, doesn't require a huge amount of effort. It requires a sustained effort, but it doesn't require a huge amount of capital. It requires sustained effort and a certain amount of discipline, which is fairly, if I may say so, easy to do. It's just that there has to be political will uh, for that to be achieved. Um, may I, may yeah, I just say know. though, Rajneesh, I mean, yeah. a lot of these value chains which, which have evolved have been targeted on Western markets. And, and I feel that that's one of the things that actually creates the degree of vulnerability in some of those value chains. Yeah. So the countries suddenly become vulnerable to changes in cytosanitary standards. Yeah. That's happened repeatedly across the continent with regards to exports to the European Union, for example. Or um, if it's you know, textiles and clothing value chain, then they become you know, suddenly vulnerable to changes of policy on the part of the US market. Um, and so that's why the continental market is so different because this is permanent reciprocal market access. It's not possible to take it away and in principle not possible to change the rules either. And it's a process of harmonization and standardization as well. So African countries recognize each other's products on an equal footing. And it's a process that the European Union went through and was quite a painful long, you know, long process as well. 
but it's essential for the continent to develop those regional value chains, I feel. Um, yeah. yeah, so and if I can just add, uh, Rajneesh, as you're saying, uh, this is possible, it's doable. And we only have to look at Botswana, right? Mm -hmm. where, where they just did a, a law saying that you cannot export diamonds unless they are cut and polished yeah. in the country. And that was actually quite a revolution. It just required political will. And then yeah. of course the policy measures and the law to do it. Of course, that's with respect to diamonds, but it can be also applied with respect to agro processing. So political will is key. But I just wanted to add the term this talk about value addition and diversification, I think need, needs to be premised on um, building a sound technological base. So science, technology, and innovation are key. If you have this in place, if you, if you get the ecosystem for innovation right, then you can sensibly talk about value addition and diversification. Value addition will not happen by itself. You need to have the technological capacity in order for the value addition to, to happen. So this means in practical terms that you need community incubation centers, especially we are talking about value addition uh, in the rural areas or for rural communities. I think this would be some simple policy intervention that can help. Yes, if, and if I may say on that, um, you know, France is, is clearly influenced by Professor Juma on that particular point, and I think he's quite right to stress it. And one of the weaknesses for the continent, unfortunately, has been, you know, the very, very low, low levels of R&D and, and investment in, in science and technology. Um, I feel partly that reflects the lack of larger companies on the continent, um, because as we know globally, it's the larger companies which are responsible for the bulk of R&D. And on the continent currently, there's too much emphasis on small and micro-sized enterprises on the, in the belief that they're the ones that create the bulk of employment, which is true globally, of course. You know, it's a truism that small companies create the bulk of employment, but they're not necessarily the ones that are driving the economic growth and development and not the ones that support the ecosystem of all the rest of the economy behind it. So one of my arguments has been, you know, with the implementation of the AFCFTA, there has to be a slight change of focus and we need to do more to see what the problems are with those larger companies and, and how to get more competitive, larger business groups across the continent. Um, I, I have to disagree with you a little on that. Uh, and I agree that the role of the multinational, the large firms is important, but I think that there is a significant role for, for the state here in terms of, of leveraging universities who are embedded in the local environment and are able to develop what used to be known as appropriate technologies. Um, uh, you know, the, it's simply in the agricultural value chain. One of the, I was talking to somebody uh, following this, this project I'm, I'm, I'm undertaking currently uh, about a gentleman who was do, doing research. And one thing he noticed is that people sell their grain immediately to the, as soon as the harvest happens, uh, to the big uh, silos, to the big multinationals. Uh, but everyone sells at the same time. So if you stored the grain for two months or three months and sold it when the prices went up after this harvest season, you got a higher price. But of course, that meant that people had to learn how to store grain without losing any to pests. And then simply the local university then kind of investigates sustainable traditional ways of preserving the grain, preventing pests and introducing new simple technologies, which even illiterate farmers are able to implement, utilize, maintain. And this was actually a very important uh, uh, lesson. I, I discovered that there are so many small incremental technological changes that can be fed in. Uh, so I suppose it's both, both of them are necessary, doing it from the bottom and doing it from the top. So, I was know, going to say, it's not mutually yeah. exclusive yeah. to have, you know, larger companies doing more investment in research and investigation and the government to have a strong yeah. role there. Um, Rajneesh, actually, you've got another question yes. in the um, comment there. Uh, Roger Fon, uh, yeah, particularly no, about our, our favourite topic. We have Turkey, uh, Turkey, um, oh, yes, Turkey I, Mudev, uh, well, who's can, asking, yeah. uh, can, perhaps you can, let me see if I can paraphrase this for you. Um, I can't um, see that question. Let me just see. I can read it. 
Yeah, why don't you go ahead, uh, Jonathan? Is against the background, thank you, Torque, against the background of the skepticism of that great illusion of trade peace nexus, what's the role of the AFCTFA, ASCFTA in the pursuit of peace and security on a continent? Can trade under the ACFTA sine qua non lead to peace in Africa? So there's an interesting one about does trade stabilize and lead to peace? What do you think? Yes. That's what, I think that's what yes. you're saying. Can it stabilize? Francis, do you have a strong view on this? Oh, yes, I have a very strong view of, on this. Yeah, whatever you may say against the European Union, I think it represents the proposition that trade can create peace. Uh, because since the establishment of the European Union, I think we have not had a big war in Europe uh, for over a generation, for over 70 years, especially between France and Germany, or the UK and, and, and Germany, for that matter. Of course, now we have Russia and Ukraine, but uh, we are really not talking about the European Union uh, in that case. So, so trade can, can, can lead to peace. It can contribute uh, to peace. When stakeholders have got a vested interest, when they grow a vested interest in an economic integration arrangement, they will want to preserve it. They will not want to kill the market, they will not want to kill the people, they will not want to destroy the infrastructure that exists to facilitate uh, their economic activities. And they will want peace and stability in order to be able to carry on with their lives, including trading and doing other economic uh, activities. So that's why there are quite a number of projects actually, or programs across the continent meant to promote peace through trade. In Comesa, for instance, uh, there's a program there called Trading for Peace, which has been, uh, which, which is meant to actually help to stabilize uh, these volatile regions like Congo DR, or relations between Ethiopia and some of its neighbors. And uh, actually at the African continent of free trade area, we now want to replicate this continentally so that we have some form of simplified trade regime or trading for peace, uh, which through trade can contribute uh, to peace. Yeah. Also, if you look at Africa. Africa. Yes, please. I was just gonna, I was just gonna add the, the example now of uh, DRC joining the East Africa community. Right. I think one of the underlying, you know, long-term goals of that from the perspective of DRC is to join a regional bloc and make make going backwards in terms of policy much more difficult in the future through those stronger right. investment trade links. And it's very similar to what Spain did in 1981 after the coup d'etat, they had or attempted coup d'etat. They wanted to join the European Union as quickly as possible because the socialist government at the time realized that once they were in Europe, it would make those kinds of, of coup impossible. So mm -hmm. yes, I, I, I just like to add my two cents to what Francis is saying there, um, I agree. Raj, you are on mute. We have a question from uh, Roger Fon. Uh, uh, so a lot has been said about the effects of the free trade area on inter-African trade. To what extent will uh, the free trade area produce opportunities for inter-African trade? And to inter-African FDI, sorry. Yes. Yeah, well, that's our favorite topic, isn't it? And I, 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 I yeah. expected the Dunning yeah. Africa Center in honor of John Dunning, we should talk about this a little bit, yeah. Yes. Well, the, the one thing I'd point to in my presentations generally is um, actually the very high rate of profitability you'll see in a lot of manufacturing sectors across the continent. They're not, they don't tend to be opportunities which African business people take advantage of to the full extent that they could, but they definitely exist. If you, if you look at the profitability rates across sectors in lists like, for example, the African business list of uh, 250 largest firms or the Jean Afrique's listing of 500 largest companies across the continent, and you break it down by sectors, you see high degrees of profitability. So I think that should be a spur once the investment protocol is finalized uh, and once you know countries all treat in a homogenous way foreign investors across borders in the kind of you know non biased way that should happen in a regional block, I think you will see a boom in intra-African FDI. And just to give one example now, um, OCP, which is you know one of the largest Moroccan companies and major producers of fertilizers globally, 
has been investing in Eastern Africa, a, a large plant they're going to open in Ethiopia, another one in Rwanda. And that's the kind of example of very positive cross-border FDI, I think, which will have very positive growth effects on the receiving economies. Right. And uh, if I may just add, I think if you, if, if you follow the press, the announcements, you know, um, every now and then about new investments that are being made uh, to leverage actually the African continent of free trade area. Uh, for instance, uh, Congo DR and Zambia, they have just reached an agreement uh, to set up uh, uh, a lithium um, regional value chain uh, to supply the whole continent, right? In, in the pharmaceutical sector, I think we've got lots of investments being announced now uh, to supply the entire continent. So through regional value chains, I think there's going to be quite a lot of intra-Africa uh, FDI, if you call it. Though for purposes of Africa, we wouldn't call it foreign. Right. Yeah, it is still just direct investment. I really also agree with, I mean, this is a, there is a great opportunity here. Um, they are very entrepreneurial companies across Africa and, you know, the circumstances and conditions and infrastructure challenges that uh, firms face in one part of Africa are not hugely different from another part. And they have therefore a natural advantage also in investing across. I want to say, however, that you know, money has no, has no smell, as uh, Tela uh, would say. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, it's, there's the issue of uh, rules of, of the origin of capital, whether it's, uh, it's what it does, what it can do in terms of generating jobs, in terms of generating uh, linkages with domestic uh, uh, companies of what spurring economic growth that's what matters whether it whether where it comes from is less important unless of course there are political uh, challenges associated with it and I think that uh, that uh, really there will be a lot more intra-African trade I wouldn't say that it will become the dominant form because it's uh, because naturally they are by definition fewer large companies with the competitive skills to compete successfully against uh, the big European, American, or Japanese multinationals. But certainly uh, there is space for, for, for domestically or Africa-focused M&Es to, to become uh, more significant. And we're going to see that for sure. Uh, I, no, I don't think you're skeptic, but... Uh... You, you, you wouldn't want to stress, you know, I mean, the, the, the striking thing about foreign direct investment from, from places like the US, or, United Kingdom or elsewhere, is that actually the, the share of it that goes into mining is enormous. Yes. And, and actually relative, then the next sector, favored sector tends to be financial sector and it tends to head towards South Africa. Um, and the, the amount of investment they're doing in manufacturing is relatively minimal, yes. which is a shame because I believe there is a role for external investors in the manufacturing sector as well. But there is a paper um, who's, author's names I forget now, but from a few years ago, which was shown that South-South FDI was better in terms of both technological transfer because of more appropriate similar technologies being used, and also in terms of job creation because it tended to be slightly more labor intensive. So I've seen studies also which suggest that South African FDI might be more appropriate. And then, as you mentioned, the local investor has a certain advantage. So if it's a Kenyan investor invest in, you know, in, in neighboring Tanzania or Uganda, they've probably got better insights, much, much better insights than the investor coming from Japan or elsewhere. So I wouldn't underplay the role, the fundamental role that the greater cross-border investment will play in the continental free trade area. Yeah, I think one, I had an interesting conversation last time I was in, in Joburg uh, with uh, someone who is doing, uh, looking into insurance companies, South African insurance companies, who are a very major player across Africa now. And uh, one of the advantages uh, that they believe they have, and this is again uh, debatable, is that they are at the actuarial tables, uh, the calculations they've done uh, are, have relevance across the continent. Um, and uh, this is, this turns out to be something of an advantage uh, in dealing with the insurance market. And one has seen the expansion, particularly in Nigeria, for instance, uh, insurance industry is 
got a very large South African uh, presence, uh, which is becoming more and more important over time. And in fact, even the American and European multinational insurance companies use South Africa for their, their African headquarters and then expand outward using South African expertise to enter the rest of the continent. So yes, this would we, we, we used to have Sanlam was very present, which was a Moroccan insurance company. Uh, but I believe last year was taken over by a South African company. Um, yeah. So that used to be very present in East Africa, and they're still there, but now under new ownership. So yes, you're quite right on that. Yeah, I, I know I'm supposed to sound like a skeptic, but I'm beginning to feel that uh, there's some- I, I We're winning the this. argument, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I don't want to admit that's this. Right. That's right, that's right, that's right. Right, you just have to do that. To but could I, could I also just point out that uh, there are these uh, stories uh, about how we made it in Africa. I don't know whether somebody has been following them. There are lots of stories, they come out every day. Just if you search how we made it in Africa, companies every day showcasing, you know, what they are doing across the continent. And some of them are just small companies, but of course, tap into the large companies and they work together. To yes, I mean, strategic, strategically speaking, Rajneesh, um, it's, it's normally, well, and I don't, this is definitely a choice for Africa itself as well. Is, is it better to target the larger higher income markets, even if those markets are saturated and quite sluggish in growth or, you know, precarious? Or is it better to go to the smaller markets where the growth rate is much faster and there's much faster rate of consumption spending, which tends to be the case across the African continent? You know, for mm -hmm. me, if I was in a company starting out, I'd definitely go for the latter strategy. And I think that's the argument we have to make about the continental free trade area. Right. There has been a, quite a lot of venture capital as well, because you know, venture capitalists are looking for high returns uh, and they don't mind high risk for high returns. And, uh, you know, especially, uh, uh, yeah, one can see in Kenya, there's a fair amount of, uh, of uh, uh, money going into fintech uh, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Ghana. Uh, and opportunities, of course, for uh, for venture capitalists is quite considerable. So there is an opportunity. I think that as long my my concern is, of course, is that very often there is a, the governments seem to a number of governments seem to see uh, FDI as a, a source for uh, increasing uh, uh, penalty uh, almost penalty like uh, tariffs. Uh, uh, and expectations in terms of building infrastructure, providing uh, you know jobs for their friends and so on, that we sometimes have this politics getting in the way of business, which is not just uh, associated with multinational, but also with domestic firms. And again, I can speak about Nigeria here with some confidence uh, as that being a and being a problem. But um, yes, I think uh, I th I think we had another comment here from Z from. Uh, let's see who was this gentleman who I've seen, Ziad, uh, who I was named, I've come across uh, uh, Ziad Hamoui, uh, and he's he also he more or less agrees with uh, this. Uh, yes, but how how do we? So he mentions here that uh, African leadership is picking up the speed on integration, and there's still skepticism uh, of the benefits of integration. Uh, we need to take the African free trade area and in the integration benefits mainstream. So, what, what? How does one do that? Let me let me turn this to to Francis. How do we bring this to the the average guy, the small and medium enterprise, the small businesses? You know, we've talked a lot about big multinationals and uh, big businesses. What about the what about the guy on the street? How do we make it mainstream? How do we bring ben benefits? To the grassroots, right. So I think actually, actually, Africa is already saturated with talk about how to be inclusive, how to make sure that SMEs are brought into the loop and benefit from the AFCFTA. I think the messaging there has been quite, uh, quite right uh, and is adequate. And uh, I believe that uh, the ordinary person knows about the AFCFTA, though, though of course surveys show that you know in some parts of Africa. For instance, in Ghana, where uh, Ziad comes from, uh, it was showed that at some stage, I think in 2021, that only about 26% of the population knew about the AFC FTA or were gearing to use it. 
But uh, subsequent uh, surveys show that this number has actually improved quite a deal, quite a, quite quite a, quite a lot. Right. So I think that's that's right. But as Andrew has been saying, uh, Andrew Mold here. There are several Andrews around, so I need to specify. <laughs> right. And the uh, just you have eventually agreed. So it, there's no dichotomy. We don't need to say it's either SMEs or the big country, big companies. They need to work together through regional value chains. Yes. So I think what uh, Ziad probably is raising is how to continue communicating, sending out this message that SMEs should not be left behind, that they should take up opportunities that open up under the AFCFTS. So that's the messaging part of it. And then the second bit is to put in place facilitative arrangements. For instance, uh, the AFCFTS Secretariat, together with the Africa Export Import Bank, Africa Bank, have put in place financing facilities, credit lines for SMEs. Other initiatives are from the Afro Champions who have also put up some uh, credit lines, financing uh, lines for SMEs. So financing is going to be extremely important. Well, as we all know on the continent, I think this is a big area to look into. Interest rates are too high, 20%, 30%. It wouldn't make sense for SMEs to go to the bank uh, to get a loan at such an interest rate, right? So we need also to look into this or through, of course, uh, uh, strengthening the uh, financial sector and uh, improving competitiveness there, uh, diversifying the financial products on the, on the, in the financial sector. So that's another uh, area. Then thirdly, and I think this is quite important, is just market intelligence. So there are SMEs that have got products which are actually of good quality, which could actually, you know, uh, you know, um, go out into the global market and the, the continental market. But the information is not available in terms of where their products are on demand or where they could trade. So we need also to deal with market intelligence. Unfortunately, under the AFCFT, we have got this Africa Trade Observatory, which is just a simple uh, tool, a market intelligence tool, which helps. Uh, people. So we need to deal with market intelligence as well to provide information. And then, of course, we need to deal with these practical arrangements like clustering, agglomeration. Uh, I think, uh, Rajnesh, you, did you mention something about uh, uh, cooperatives, as they used to be called in those days? Warehousing. I think you called it warehousing. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. So these practical arrangements can also help SMEs, you know, to bulk and be able to maybe operate. Francis? Uh, Sorry, Andy, go ahead. Right, Andy, yes, yeah, so, over to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually in Accra at the moment. Um, UNCTAD's organizing a workshop on uh, special economic zones here. And uh, the topic came up immediately this morning about this high interest rates that Francis is talking about. I think one of the things that fundamentally handicaps African business is the high interest rates that the banks charge. And there I feel, you know, somebody needs to really rise to the challenge of looking at this more closely and putting political pressure on the banks because I feel one of the underperforming sectors across the continent is paradoxically the banking sector. Now I say paradoxically because we have this rise of Pan-African banks with presence across the continent uh, which has been very effective over the last two or three decades. You know Nigerian banks have a presence across <laughs> many parts of the continent now um, we have more competition in inverted commas in the sector, and yet interest rates remain at ridiculously high levels. And, and, and I don't think there's any good economic justification for why they are so, so high. You know, you hear the standard arguments about lack of collateral or lack of information, but to me, they sound like more like excuses. And if you look at the return on equity in a lot of these banks, it's extremely high. So at one point in Kenya a few years ago, 30% return on equity a year. You know, there's, that's <laughs> ridiculous. That's like four times more profitable than the US banking sector. So I think we need to look at this. There needs to be serious political consideration because I've never been in a forum about manufacturing and industrialization in the continent without this topic of high interest rates coming up. And I feel that the, the banking sector gets a bit of an easy ride politically on this particular topic. Yes. Um, so, um, can I just... Sorry, please, John, sorry. yes, sir. yeah. I just thought, you know, I'm dean of a business school, you know, and, and also chair of a chamber of business. So I'd like to just switch this a little bit, you know, and take the view of you advising some of these 
business people and these um you know I, i'm gonna use you for some some good advice consultancy what would you say to the ceos of businesses who, who want to make use want to capitalize want to develop um develop in the in in the, in the view of this this emerging uh, um agreements you know the content of free trade area what would you well, tell them to do you, you know john i i would strongly stress that the continental free trade area can't resolve all the developmental challenges the continent has and this is one particular mm. example you know i mean i think this is a thing that national governments need to deal with and tackle why their banking sectors are so inefficient so for example in ghana they were saying this morning the rate of interest is 25 percent where are you going to find a, a business opportunity which is going to give you a sufficient rate of return to generate that amount of profits and leave you with 25 percent you know on your initial investment just to pay that off each year you know very very few so i i do believe it needs to be tackled but i'm not sure we can put it frame it within the continental free trade agreement and that's simply because i, I strongly believe we have to focus the agreement on cross-border trade and investment and how to increase that degree of uh, integration and the third element in it which we haven't talked about which takes me back to what I was just going to mention from Francis's intervention is about the free movement protocol because mm. um what mm. Rajneesh was asking about you know general knowledge about the AFCFTA I think there's a lot of work to be done on popularizing making people aware of the agreement in the street in general it's a very important part we've learned through Brexit that misinformation about you know the costs and benefits of a regional integration project can be extremely costly, can't it, for a society? But isn't that, isn't so that I do. Different? Yeah, it's just we don't get the information out to people. We, we have these conversations in this in, in yes. this high level way, and people who are too rushed to read the long articles need it synthesized and visual and put in front of well, them and give them very good guidelines. Indeed, mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely the case. And um, yes, I mean that's why I was going to say I think continental integration as, as, as my intellectual guru of um, Tandika Makandawiri was saying, you know, like on the African continent, it's tend to be a top down process. It's tend to be the leaders that have taken the decisions mm. and it's percolated down. Now, that's true in other integration processes as well, but it is very important that there's a strong base amongst the population for support for the integration on the continent. And I, and I said at the beginning, you know, I feel that Pan-African feeling is quite widespread across the continent. But I think more needs to be done in terms of reaching out to the general public so they know about this agreement and feel invested in it. And, mm -hmm. and, and the one area where I think a lot of people would be invested in it would be the free movement protocol. And both Francis and, and myself, me, we both feel strongly on this particular theme. Free movement protocol would greatly benefit young people across the continent. When you see the sect the surveys consistently of of where the problems are in businesses what the main constraints are um, high interest rates is one another is lack of skilled staff and yet across the continent we see the educational systems you know producing a lot of graduates in different areas you know with specialization in engineering computer right. science right. everything the problem is they can't necessarily find work in their home countries and so I think the free movement protocol would be the third pillar of the continental project and would really be one of the things to make the continental project work very effectively and one that would really help in terms of gaining popular support across the continent as well. So people can see the tangible benefits for themselves. Thank you. Right. And uh, what, what, yes, Coming I was just going now. to say what I would say, I was just going to say to John that uh, what I would say to uh, this CEO is to prepare to attend the next intra-Africa trade fair. And the next one is going to be in Senegal. The last one, which was Wait, in Durban. What is it, that? Senegal when? Intra-Africa trade fair. They happen Intra every two years, yes. Now, uh, the, the last one, which happened in Durban, in South Africa, generated bill, uh, deals, business deals, worth $42 billion in a space of just a week, right? So I would say, please, please prepare to go there. But what we have been saying, the value proposition for the AFC FTA is, is as follows. There's the large market, right? Whether you want to talk about it in terms of the uh, GDP at purchasing power parity. Uh, Andrew, is this $6.7 trillion or something like that? All right. Or you want to talk about 
political will. I think business wants to know whether political leaders are really into this. And then thirdly, predictability, because the AFCFTA is going to be a rule-based system where rights can be enforced, obligations can be enforced. So this also is good for business. So this uh, large market, political will and leadership, and then predictability should be uh, good news uh, for CEOs to hear around the continent. But if you Thank got the intra Africa trade, yes, you'll be in good company there. But I know that one of your problems, one of your challenges is that digitization isn't happening and there aren't enough resources in the governments. You know, what do you think is going to happen there? Can we help there? Can we manage in spite of that? John, what do you mean digitization is not happening? I mean, I see it quite pervasively across our region. I mean, in terms of, you know, e-government, for example, and particularly during the pandemic, there's been an acceleration in other countries which were going slower are now seeing the benefits from that. Um, why do you get the perception that digitalization is going so slow? I would have thought the continent's actually quite fast off the mark in some areas like e-PESA, you know, money transfers, uh, precisely because of the <laughs> slowness of the more traditional ways of communicating. Well, I think that's very true in a lot of ways. I mean, I partly say it because Francis has written about it, just to provoke him to say something, but um, on, on that particular subject. But um, I think it's very true that we are getting that, but it's it's so scattered, you know, internet access is so variable and scattered in some areas that, um, you know, how do we make these things happen? Short of waiting for Amazon or, or Musk to fill the sky, the sky with satellites, we are still having a digital divide in many places. But I'd love to hear Francis's view on that. Yeah, so what I would say, what I would say is that uh, what you identify as a challenge there, for instance, you know, uh, internet access, limited internet access, is in fact a business opportunity. So if I were speaking to a CEO and he told me, oh, there's no internet access, I said, well, go provide it. <laughs> go provide it. There's a business opportunity there, right? But uh, as Andrew is saying uh, clearly, uh, I think Africa is actually being recognized as uh, uh, making quite some headway. Uh, in terms of what's called leapfrogging. Uh, leapfrogging is a phrase now we throw around quite a bit. Yeah, whether it's in terms of mobile telephony, you know, fintech, you know, all these all these things. In, in now talking about the AFCFT in particular, I hope you know we are going to have a dedicated protocol on digital trade, right? So the AFC is supposed to be a digital uh, free trade area. And uh, what's the evidence so far? What's the track record so far uh, in terms of digitalization? we've got a, a digital system for addressing non-tariff barriers. If you want to check it out, it's tradebarriers.africa. Or there's an equivalent for Comesa EAC and SADC, which is tradebarriers.org. It's open to everybody, right? And then uh, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, which is a tool for dealing with this challenge that we have got 42 different currencies on the continent. It's going to facilitate payment, uh, intra-Africa payment, cross-border payment. Then we have got to what I mentioned earlier, the Africa Trade Observatory for market intelligence. This is a tool which has also been uh, rolled out. So the evidence is that actually the AFCFTA is quite digital and they, we have noticed or, or appreciated the importance of digitalization in making life easier for everybody, but also in terms of facilitating trade and investment across borders, across the continent. Thank yes. you. So pass uh, back to Rajin, to summarize is that do attend the Inter-African Trade Fair in Senegal in 2023. I, I have, yeah, we're definitely so, worth attending. I haven't, we should yeah. make it, we should make a trip, uh, John, you and I, uh, at least with the, with the, we need to, the Learning Africa Center needs to be there. Um, I think there are a lot of issues that are coming up. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this always happens. The best issues are saved for last. I can see a conversation about regulation, the challenges of regulation, because this is going to be one of the bigger challenges is that is to standardize regulation across across uh, countries and uh, coordinate them. So one of the points Andy you brought up was about uh, bank charges. And, you know, I, it's true that that in absence of good regulation, banks are, are making a fortune just charging you money for 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 holding your money for them, you know, for you. Uh, they make the money, you make nothing out of it because they're just sucking you dry with all kinds of unnecessary charges. And, you know, a powerful regulation regulator is really important for this to happen. 
And this is one of those uh, challenges that you know, we can learn from the, uh, from the EU in that regard, right? and putting in these, so that the same st safety standard, the same uh, uh, banking charges, the yeah. same rights of, of consumers and so on. Do, you know, not do, even uh, from the EU, Rajneesh, I was going to say. Um, so for example, I, I, Comessa, where um, Francis was formerly the DG of trade, Comessa has a competition authority, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and it deals with quite a lot of cases of mergers and acquisitions. I don't yeah. remember the figures exactly in Francis, but it's an institution which is a useful building block for the yeah. continental agreement because we need that kind yes. of competition yes. authority yes. To, yes. to get the same benefits that European consumers did under the European Union. And we have an right. example in the East Africa community with the single digital area which was agreed in principle for the EAC, but only three countries implemented it in the end. And it was Rwanda, uh, Uganda, and Kenya. And initially there was, you know, reaction against it. Um, but in actual fact, the telephone, te <laughs> the, uh, telephone companies actually found that they didn't mm -hmm. lose much by having yeah. a single charge because of the increased volume of traffic. And that's mm -hmm. an example where maybe member states individually can't act easily but when it becomes a regional yeah. question and a regional decision mm -hmm. suddenly it becomes more likely that the policy is actually yeah. implemented yeah no, I, I think uh, there's a there's a lot of discussion that we i think i wish we had two more hours but i don't think we do unfortunately um i think what the another issue that pops up that is popping up as we speak uh, we have a comment that just came on the screen which uh, is about the issue of inter-african trade versus uh, inter uh, uh, African uh, trade, inter, you know, international prop, being part of the global system. And a lot of people seem to think, a lot of people I've met seem to think that it's a substitute, that inter-African trade is a substitute, and that isn't the case. Um, and it's very important to remember that you know, isolationism is not the objective of, the, of uh, any free trade agreement. In fact, it is to increase uh, participation in the global economy and it gives you strength by because of scale. Uh, that's the most important thing. I'm not entirely certain. I, uh, I'm sure that the movement of people, while it's a great idea, uh, it also has sociological challenges. Uh, as we can see the reaction to immigration, whether it's Nigeria or South Africa or uh, uh, countries in between, uh, but that's a conversation I think that we're going to have to save for our next uh, session, because I'm certain now, Francis uh, and Andy, well, we will need a second session because um, this, is a, a, this is an important subject that deserves more attention. There are many, many, many interesting issues that are worth debating. And I'm, uh, I'm really grateful that uh, you've taken the time out of your busy schedules um, uh, I personally would have been, you know, I would love to have been in Accra right now uh, and drinking pepper soup with uh, with Andy. I know a couple of good restaurants in, in the Oxford Street area. Uh, alas, I'm I'm in uh, I'm not uh, over there. Uh, so I, I think that you know I think that John and I both are really really grateful that you've taken the time. Uh, to to uh, come in and talk to, and I really also apologize, uh, um, uh, as Andrea has just done, for not being able to answer all these questions that have been popping up on the screen, uh, and that I would like to have had more time to do so. But uh, uh, I'm certain that you will be more than delighted to join us again. I think we already have you scheduled for a return visit uh, for part two. Uh, John, can I end with a piece of good news, Rajneesh? Because yesterday, IHS Towers in Lagos just did a, something like a, a 6.4 billion rand um, investment, you know, into MTN in South Africa to get ah. 13,000 towers. So that's a, that's pretty good. Excellent. So that was a very welcome move. So it's apropos this, this topic. And I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. And um, I also quite enjoyed Andrew's uh, curating of the conversation as well. He's a natural chairman too, isn't he? Both of you are. Yes, so thank yes. you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. We have the next the next session of the Dunning Africa Center webinar series is what can Francophone Africa teach Anglophone Africa? 
uh, with some of our colleagues uh, really? based in Nome. <laughs> uh, so it'll be a it'll be a, a bilingual session uh, uh, on the first Thursday of every month. Uh, people note it down in your diary. I'll be sending out announcements, but uh, this should be interesting. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time.